joining me on this cocktail and conversation. I know it's been a super long day. You did the MSNBC, you did your calls with various campaigns. So I just feel honored you're taking the time to do the cocktails and conversation. Sorry, I don't have a cocktail, but we can have a conversation. Oh, I got some yeah, I, I have I quite a cocktail either. I have just some um, pineapple juice, but cheers mm -hmm. to it anyway. Okay. For the city of Atlanta globally and uh, you've seen so much um, you know from the civil rights movement onward to where we are now how has your life changed since the uh, pandemic you said you've had to do a lot of your work from home on quarantine well it, it uh, I mean I'm I've been supposed to be retired now for <laughs> I don't know how long but uh, I've never considered myself retired, but this sort of retired me yeah. in that it kept me from traveling. Mm -hmm. And uh, it made me stay close to home. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, they, uh, they won't let me drive. <laughs> so uh, your so, license has been sequestered? Okay. So I've been reading mm -hmm. and thinking and uh, I, I, I don't know how to make sense of this, but the pandemic, I always think of crises as opportunities. Oh, absolutely. And uh, when everything, when nothing else is working, you have to try something new. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's one of the things that the crises could see is, the pandemic is not only a health crisis, uh, part of it is a climate crisis, and we had those storms. We've had, I think, maybe 14 or 15 hurricanes already, and this is just usually awesome. when hurricanes are usually just starting mm -hmm. in, in August, last of August and September. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's a climate crisis. Sure. Uh, and um, both of those put us in an economic crisis. Absolutely. Uh, and it, it it just requires that we rethink our lives. And I wonder, I wonder if isn't that isn't the intention or the purpose of the crisis. And so I, uh, I've been looking for what is it that can come out of these crises that's, uh, that's new and different and more fitted for the second half of the 21st century. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And I'm not sure that I'm getting many answers yet. Uh, in my own mind, but uh, and I think that the mistake if we jump on to the president um, I think the mistake that he's making is that he's trying to deny these crises sure. he, pulled, he pulled us out of the climate talk and the Paris and he uh, we withdrew from the World Health Organization and um, these are things that the U.S. created and that gave us a chance to lead the rest of the world and he pulled out of them thinking that we were carrying more than our weight which we were but that's the price we've paid to be able to run the world. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's much cheaper than war. Uh, and it's much easier for us to lead the world and prevent these crises. For instance, I don't know whether you were aware of it or not, but when the Ebola crisis hit about, oh, maybe six years ago, mm -hmm. uh, six or seven um, it never got to the United States 
no, because no, no. the president then president obama got vice president joe biden joe biden mm -hmm. and um susan rice i think was at the u.n or national security advisor and they picked up a significant part of the center for disease control and they moved the center for disease control africa to sort of keep it over there yeah absolutely it does and so it never got us but that's because they got ahead of the virus yeah by denying it we waited until the virus got here and took control of us and we're still not through with it yeah, we still have um, two days to go, but I think... And it's 180,000 people dead. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, and that was probably not necessary. Yeah. I think, you know, as a surgeon and a scientist, that was the most sobering and unconscionable approach is to pull out of the, the global medical community because that is our north star you know that is how we as scientists as physicians help to guide through of course research and data and facts epidemiologically what should be the approach to to any pandemic and, well, so and we're going to get these pandemics we're going to get diseases exactly uh they're, they're going to crop up all over the world because we're talking about a world now with uh seven and a half to eight billion people and i think uh at the time of world war ii which when i was a boy mm -hmm. the world was still just about three or four billion mm. so the population has almost doubled in my lifetime wow uh and uh it could keep on growing uh, for years to come. Yeah, so but, that's why we have to, to your point, use this as an opportunity to really see what can we learn from this? How can we address pandemics differently in the future? And the Center for Disease Control is not always the disease eradication, but really getting things under control and using the information to have better solutions to control them because you know diseases will come and that's why the World Health Organization. So we work collaboratively. And so I think we're so much stronger together. And when we isolate ourselves and not listen to science, that is when it becomes problematic. And I think we, we, we've got to that point. Well, good politics even would say we should have been cooperating with the Chinese and help keep it over there. Exactly. <laughs> and no. I think scientists do more cooperation uh, around the world uh, than most politicians do. Mm -hmm. And there, there's a general respect. Um, there's a general respect uh, amongst, say, the, the scientists, uh, this cooperation between the space uh, programs in Russia. Mm -hmm. and in the United States uh, once we got to, the, to an agreement that we were not going to have nuclear weapons in space then we started cooperating and I think we can make when we're cooperating politically we can collaborate medically and we could do a lot to prevent uh Well, almost anything that we we kind of we know more than we want to deal with. Yeah. Uh, now, one of the things I think we know more of, and I think more research needs to be discussed around it, is just the selenium nutrient yeah. deficiency. You, it's a key role, and like. COVID-19 severity. I did have an opportunity to look up some articles. Good. So I'm so glad we, we got a chance to chat about that uh, earlier. Did you, did you find that article in the Journal of 
clinical nutrition? I did, I did, and I actually found some more data since we spoke. And, um, yeah, so can you just share a little bit about what your thoughts on um, the mineral selenium? Well, it happened when um, when I was traveling around for the Olympics. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the places I visited was Senegal yes. in West Africa. And in Senegal, they were curing HIV AIDS. And um, nobody believed it. But then the Ford Foundation sent a group of scientists over to check um, the patients that they were treating. And um, they ran tests on 62 patients who had full-blown AIDS, uh, very low T-cell counts, and very high viral loads. And in six weeks, they came back and tested them again. And the viral load was gone. And uh, the T-cell counts were way up. And they came back five years later, and only one of that group had died. Wow. And, uh, and he'd been hit by a truck. <laughs> <laughs> so his cause of death was not related to the virus. To the virus, yeah. yeah. Uh, so I was curious about that mm -hmm. uh, and uh, went to the place where these treatments were going on and tried to figure out what happened. Mm -hmm. And um, they wouldn't talk about it because they said, this is our traditional knowledge. And we don't want somebody taking it and trying to put a patent on it sure. and selling it for plenty of money. Uh, they would, they were really, um, I think that the treatments that they were giving, um, you know, were, were, were literally for pennies. Yeah. And at that time, the antiretrovirals was selling for something like nine hundred dollars a month, and which, yeah, that's really uh, a lot, yeah. But over there, it was, it was really just a couple of dollars for the entire treatment, mm -hmm. and uh, I stayed in touch with them, and over the last ten years, and they're still going strong, and they're still. Uh, they're still having success. And so I, when I, next, last time I went, I, um, the lady that uh, showed me around and who spoke good English mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. also happened to be, uh, well, a very attractive African woman. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and there's, there's, a, there's a certain, it doesn't hurt. <laughs> there's, no, there's certain blue-black complexion in Senegalese women. Oh, that's a beautiful. Uh, and, beautiful. Uh, and she was taking me around mm -hmm. in a yellow sari. Mm. Um, a very striking image. It's like you remember yeah. yesterday. I remember what she, because she, she was built like uh, Serena Williams. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like like a superwoman, and the first thing I asked her was, "How did you get here?" Sure, See, sure. and she said, um, "I came here as a patient." Mm -hmm. I said, "A patient for what?" And she took me in the doctor's um, office, and there was a picture of a <laughs> creature, and it was just skin, skin and bones. Wow. Uh, and her face was all bleeding and I mean she was and she said they found me in the gutter. And they put her in a wheelbarrow, right? And they they put her in a wheelbarrow and took her to the hospital. Took her there to this clinic. Because none of the hospitals would would take them. And so I, I got very personal in uh, trying to figure out what did they do. And she said, I, I don't have, remember taking any medicine. I don't remember um, 
any shots, mm -hmm. uh, no x-rays or radiation treatment. And I said, well, what did you do? And she said, well, we just ate and we, she said, we had a porridge of some kind every morning for breakfast. And uh, they had a kind of vegetable soup or, or stew uh, for lunch. And they'd have tea, some kind of herb tea at night. Uh, and that's all she could remember. And I said, there's nothing else. She said, well, before we had tea, tea before we went to bed every night, the drums played and we danced as much as we could. Wow. And she said at first, you know, I, she couldn't move, but they made her get out and clap her hands and do something. Yeah. But the, that seemed to be the whole program. And wow. that at the end of about two weeks, when she started getting her health back, she said, uh, there came a time when it was just very hard to urinate. And uh, that's the only time that anything was painful. She said, but that didn't last but a couple of days. And then it just seemed like everything just gushed out. Yeah, wow. And <laughs> so um, they tested the urine mm -hmm. and they found it? that the urine uh -huh. um, was filled with the, with the HIV virus. Wow. And so whatever they were eating was purging the blood so the viral load came out through the urine mm -hmm. but when they tested the blood the blood was free of the virus oh wow and so there was something in that diet now one of the things we knew and it was even true of ebola that there was almost no Ebola in Senegal. And that Senegal had a very high level of selenium. In the soil. Like in, in the, the soil. soil. So the vegetables they were eating um, was bringing about what we would call a cure. Sure. They didn't even want to talk about it in terms of cure. They said it just purged the food kept them healthy. Yeah. And um, that's when we sent, uh, there was a terrible case of, of Ebola in uh, Liberia. Mm -hmm. And uh, Alex Cummings of Coca-Cola was flying back to li Liberia. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, I think it must have been a Coca-Cola plane. And we asked him, could we put some selenium on the plane? So we, we really went to Walmart mm -hmm. uh, and we bought $5,000 worth of selenium. That's a lot of selenium. Well, $5,000 worth of selenium was a thousand bottles with 90 tablets in it each. Wow. Uh, and so, Liberia has a kind of a kind of a caste system. The American Liberians get most of the attention. Sure. Sort of like segregation in South Africa, only everybody's black. <laughs> some of them were in families that came back from America and some of them were indigenous people. But they're basically same tribe, same language. Uh, but the ordinary folk were dying faster and not getting much uh, medical attention. Mm -hmm. So Alex distributed the selenium through the nonprofits wow. uh, to the poor. Uh, at the end, of, uh, Liberia ended up on the cover of Time magazine mm. for having mastered the Ebola crisis pretty well. Wow. Uh, you, know, mm -hmm. you know what I find very fascinating is that a lot of my patients want to know, like, when are we going to 
have a cure for COVID. And you know, that is, is, is a ways off. There's a lot of scientists working on it. But one of the things I found fascinating is that, and I remind them that 85% of our immune system is in our gut. And our immune system helps to control disease, whether it's cancer or whether yeah. it's COVID, you've got to understand that immunity is everything. So what you're consuming is critical. And so in no way are we claiming that, okay, selenium is the cure for COVID. No. But there have been several studies to your point to show that two things. One, that people that have a deficiency in selenium that are COVID positive have a worse outcome, meaning they don't do as well. Two, those people that are selenium rich or and take partake in selenium have um, a lower rate of uh, COVID transmission. And so what that suggests to me is that the mineral is, is extremely important and is best achieved in natural sources. Now, if you can get it in a vitamin, that's fine, but you find it in fish, you can find it in vegetables. You just want to make sure that you have- Brazil nuts. Brazil nuts are supposed to be rich in selenium. <laughs> it is, it is. So it's just so you many- You buy those at, uh, well, where is it my wife goes? Whole Foods? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, but uh, but now I read that article a long time ago. But and I was a biology major in college because my daddy wanted me to be a dentist. But like him, <laughs> I, I was in college so long. You know, I've been out of college. Next year will be my seventieth year out what? of college. How is that possible? You're only fifty. Well, yeah, I've been, I've been out of college in seven years. <laughs> I finished a little young. Oh, boy. Uh, but um, when I took biology, they didn't even know what DNA was. Wow. Now, uh, in that article, they were talking about the transmission of RNA to DNA. And I still had never, I, I, I kind of know what DNA is now because that happens and, you know, the lawyers use that in court cases to identify uh, evidence. What is RNA? Well, I'll try to keep it simple. I don't want to, like, make it too complicated, but it's, it's present in all living cells and it is, its primary role is a messenger so it translates the message and sends it to the dna communicating to the dna what to replicate what to produce and so without the rna rna is like the communicator and so it controls the growth and and synthesis of proteins of enzymes um all those things that help make the genetic component but it helps to communicate the code to the dna so the dna knows what to make so it's the messenger Okay, now, selenium, it says, seems to block the message. There's somehow that selenium acts between DNA and RNA. Yeah, and, and but that's, that's the most fascinating part about it because with the DNA that's present, you have the RNA that essentially lets the body know what to do. It sends the message from DNA so that the body knows what to produce in terms of proteins, biochemical processes, etc. And so if you can somewhat intercept that or help change the message that's coming from the DNA, you can change what the body is producing. Mm -hmm. And, and selenium somehow all the time. Selenium and, and actually the amount of selenium in a tablet is just 200 micrograms. Right, it's not a lot. Now micrograms are, well, a hundredth. Very small, very uh, small. Milligram. Yeah. It's, that's less than milligrams. It is. Mm -hmm. And uh, so a very little selenium in the diet. Now that article also uh, did a study. <laughs> Well, the, the doctor that first introduced me to the concept was 
uh, at the uh, University of Georgia. He's now at University of North Carolina. Mm -hmm. Dr. Ethan Will Taylor. Okay. And if you want, uh, if some of your people who might look at this want to find that article, it's it's his article in the journal American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. Okay, and we'll be. Uh, Okay, and I'll try to find that link and put it on um, social. But okay. to your point, I mean, just that small microgram, which is just one millionth of a gram. So it's such a tiny amount, but it has such a powerful impact. Mm -hmm. and, and so it's important that we set each other up for success in terms of this whole COVID crisis. Of course, you know, we're wearing masks, we're practicing hygiene, but it's also important that people remember their cycle, social, well-being because it's not natural to be isolated it's not natural to be quarantined and not have human contact so we have to do that but do it safely as well but it's also scientific to understand how the body works and it's more than just medical chemistry absolutely i mean so that because this is what we eat. In fact, that's what we always used to say, that that's, you are what you eat. And 85% of our immune system is in our gut. Yeah. I now, I got a lot of immunity in my gut. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I, I read somewhere also that um, there's something called leaky gut. Yes. And how do you treat that? Oh, it's so challenging. Um, before I did uh, cancer surgery, I did general and uh, trauma surgery. And leaky gut was always challenging from a surgical standpoint because it is systemic, it's physiologic. So, it, you know, we could cut out that portion of, of bad gut and do a small bowel resection, but inevitably the gut would still be leaky because the integrity of the, the bowel was compromised on the molecular level. Are there some, is there some foods or medicines that you can take? Uh, in fact, I started reading that on, uh, on my iPhone one time, mm -hmm. and somebody called me before I finished the article. Oh. I had to to find it back. But it was talking, it was, it was under Amazon, I think, and there was some product that you could order that helped to treat leaky gut syndrome. Well, you know, as a surgeon, I usually consider myself a cutter versus giving yeah. medication. <laughs> uh, but yeah, but th seriously, there, there are a lot of uh, supplements out there that are claiming to, you know, help with leaky gut syndrome. And you just have to really make sure you vet them because the supplements aren't subject to the FDA, so they don't necessarily have to prove uh, efficacy. Um, but, you know, there are things that are out there to try to help treat it, like licorice root is one of them, L-glutamine, um, prebiotics. And so a lot of times they, that's sold in um, a supplemental form. And so it does help in terms of keeping the disease under control, but it never completely eradicates it, but it definitely helps give it, you know, some semblance of control. Yeah. But okay. I'm, yeah, so anyway, I'm glad you brought that up. We just have to be mindful of what we're eating and just try to be healthier. So regardless of what we're challenged with, whether it's a COVID crisis, you know, diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease, et cetera, that we are setting our bodies and our minds up for success by eating well and being good to ourselves. And a part of that is psychosocial health. Like I cannot tell you, Ambassador Young, how we've seen this increase in, since COVID, in anxiety, depression, suicide, et cetera. So, you know, we've got to make sure that we are taking care of our mental health as well during this crisis. So, I'm, well, I'm a preacher. <laughs> and, and I think, I think that uh, faith in God and a, an awareness of yourself. Uh, in fact, that's that's the reason I quit uh, 
science for theology. Uh, that it suddenly dawned on me that everything that God created on this earth has a purpose. Absolutely. And after graduating from Howard University, I realized I had a degree and a piece of paper, but I really didn't know anything. And I, I didn't, uh, I, I had no clue as what my life should be about. Wow. But you changed the world, and, and, and you, uh, you know, I, I said you changed the world, and didn't know what you wanted well, to. That do. was that didn't start until, I mean, I had a ball in high school and college. I, I I was always younger than everybody, so I was trying to be bigger than them, a big man. And uh, how old were you when you started uh, Howard? I was, well, I started Dillard at fifteen. Wow. And I went to Howard at 60. Now, how did you and Martin meet? Well, we met, he, he went to Morehouse at 15. Right, exactly. And Maynard went to Morehouse at 14, Maynard Jackson. Wow. So it was right after, that was 1944. And so there'd been so many soldiers pulled into the war that the colleges were empty. So they let some young people skip a grade if they were kind of bright, they thought. Um, and I, I I was not in that group. I got my head start uh, in kindergarten. Okay. Because I, I could read and write in kindergarten. And so when I went to public school at six years old, they put me in third grade. Oh, wow. So uh, I was always, you know, behind uh, physically, but I could keep up mentally. And uh, so coming out of college, I was just really confused. And I'd been on Howard's track team and we stopped in North Carolina and I went out for a run. Uh, my mother and father went to uh, a church conference, and I wasn't interested in that. But running to the top of King's Mountain in North Carolina. Okay. Um, and I was really running too fast, and then I ran. I was determined to run up to the top of the mountain, and I did. Mm. But when I got there, I was totally out of breath. <laughs> and I was gasping for breath. <clears throat> Um, and I, I might have even blacked out for a little while. Oh, boy. But when I came to, the world just looked different. Wow. And all of a sudden, it, it was very clear to me that uh, everything I saw had a purpose. There was a purpose for the trees. There was a purpose for the cornfield, a purpose for the cows, uh, the clouds. Um, and it, it just hit me. But whoever made heaven and earth made everything with a purpose. And everything couldn't have a purpose except me. So I must have a purpose too. Oh, you definitely and, have a purpose. But I didn't, at that moment, I said, I don't know what it is, but I will just do the best that I can one day at a time. Sure. And whoever created me with a purpose will help me find that purpose. And so f almost from that moment on, everything I did seemed to lead me to something else. Wow. Uh, and I have honestly, in all of these 88 years, mm -hmm. never made a decision about my life three days before it happened. Is that right? Everything, that, everything that's happened to me, happened to me the day it happened. Wow. And I wasn't planning on it. I wasn't scheming to have it happen. Mm -hmm. uh, I just did what I could do that day. Mm -hmm. And the next day, I, whatever it was for me to do, I did. And one thing led to the next. And that's been the story of my life. One day at a time. So did you and Mark yeah. meet um, in college or? No, I, that was another thing that the... Uh, we were both invited to Talladega College. 
Uh -huh. I, I was a young preacher in Thomasville in Beeston, Georgia. Mm. And um, my wife was from Alabama. And um, we were, we drove up to her house in Marion, Alabama on the way to Talladega, uh -huh. where the Alphas had uh, invited Martin and me to speak at a Religious Emphasis Week program. Okay. And I always said that he was already on the cover of Time magazine and was leading the Montgomery bus boycott. And I said they invited him and they were afraid he wouldn't come. So they invited me as a backup, but we both showed up. Okay. And when we showed up together and met, we re I, I didn't think about it, but my wife knew that uh, his wife had gone to the same high school that my wife went to in Marion, Alabama. So Coretta and your wife went to the same and high Jean school? And Jean. What about Went to Lincoln School. And they both, they both had had hard times as young women. Yeah. Coretta's house was burned down by the Klan when she was 15. And uh, Jean's family had four or five businesses that uh, the white community swindled them out of. And her granddaddy committed suicide. And, oh, wow. you know, her mother was fired from her teaching job. And they, they had both had very bitter childhood. Mm -hmm. But Lincoln School had a lot of Quaker teachers. Okay. And they had taught them about nonviolence. In fact, Coretta's father had them when they came home and found the house burned down. Mm -hmm. He made them kneel down and pray. Oh, and the first, the first thing they prayed for was to thank God that none of them were in the house. Uh, and then he made them pray to forgive the sick people who burned their house down. Wow. and that they should never have any hatred or ill feeling uh, because hate is a too big a burden for them to bear. And wow. so let it go. They enjoyed the house. It was good, uh, but God provided them that house. God will provide them some other place to stay. Mm -hmm. And he was not a very well-educated man, but he was a genius. Clearly. Because he had... Uh, he was a sharecropper who had a logging company and a, a trucking company. I, I mean, a sawmill and a grocery store. So he had, oh, wow. he had he had businesses, but it was the Quaker teachers that came to teach there in Marion, Alabama, that took Jean, uh, sent her to Manchester College in Indiana and sent Coretta and her sisters to Antioch College in Ohio. Mm -hmm. And both of those were schools where they studied peace. And so both Coretta and Jean had taken courses in New Testament nonviolence before they met me or Martin. Wow, so it was the lady that was the glue that kind of brought you two together. Well, it, it was, and um, they both used to say that if we had married some of the girls that we went with in college, nobody would have ever heard our names. This <laughs> <laughs> they were not they were not shy, you know, women. Yeah, no, I love that. And that just bears to uh, give us the further emphasis on how important it is to have a good partnership. It means everything. Now, I know they were like helping to bring you guys together, this whole civil rights movement, and it just kind of took a life of its own with your blood, sweat, and tears. Um, what do you think, Martin, would think of what's going on now with like the police brutality and the resulting protests, and you just had a shooting of Jacob Blake, um, times seven in the back, approaching his vehicle. Of course, we're still waiting on the facts to bear out, but what is clear is, um, you know, there may have needed to have been a, a different de-escalation approach. Um, and so how were that uh, different from I, now versus I, when you guys were protesting? 
Well, it was a big difference. The big, biggest difference was like when I was nine years old, mm -hmm. one of my teachers took me to a courthouse to see Thurgood Marshall argue a case. Oh my gosh. That is now I was, I was 29 okay. when I hooked up with Martin Luther King. Okay. So for 20 years, Thurgood Marshall and the NAACP Legal Defense Fund had been creating a legal framework for everything we were complaining about. It took and time. so when we went to Birmingham, uh, the Legal Defense Fund sent lawyers with us not to tell us what to do, mm -hmm. but to tell us how to do it in a way that was legal and disciplined. Okay. So that we could, I mean, the amazing thing was that all the time we were there, I don't think anybody in SCLC staff spent more than, except Jose Williams. Jose Williams went on a fast in jail for, I think, almost 55 days. Oh, wow. Uh, and, uh, but Dr. King never spent more than two weeks in jail. Okay. And he did that because he wanted to. But... <clears throat> We had good legal counsel for everything we did, and we stayed in a very disciplined way within the law, and we traded, I mean, we trained the people who were marching. Now, it took us three months almost to train enough people, well, to train 55 people to go to jail with Martin Luther King. Oh my goodness. See, nowadays, the movement had 55,000 people in less than an hour, thanks to cell phones and social media. Oh. So during the three months we were training people, mm -hmm. we were also planning the strategy and planning with the lawyers. So we, we knew what we were marching for and we knew the outcome that we wanted. So there was a, a legal strategy. Um, a legal strategy and a moral strategy. Got it. Now, when we went there, Dr. King said to me, um, do you know any white people in Birmingham? Hmm. Why? I said, no, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Well, he told it to me because I grew up in a neighborhood in New Orleans that was predominantly white. It was all poor, but uh, it was an Irish grocery store on one corner, an Italian bar on another, and the Nazi party was on the third corner. Uh, and uh, they were Highland Hitler when I was four years old. And my dad had taught me about white supremacy before I went to kindergarten. Is that right? Yeah, that white supremacy is a sickness. And you know that God made of one blood all the nations of the world. Uh, they don't want to admit that God made everybody black and red and yellow, black and white. We are precious in his sight. You know, that's what we used to sing in Sunday school. Yeah. Uh, Jesus loves the little children, all the children around the world. And we sang that in Sunday school. Uh, and he just said that the Nazi party people and the white supremacists don't want to believe that God created us all equal. Mm. The Constitution and Sunday school can't be wrong. Right. So I was comfortable. I grew up in that neighborhood and I was comfortable dealing with all, well, you know how it is in your practice. Um, a lot of the, uh, well, in those days, all of the agents from the drug companies and things were white. Uh, and so there were always white people in and out of his office and his office was at home, at my home. So I, I grew up, you know, not, not feeling uh, intimidated. Yeah. Wow, that was a very important lesson that you learned very early on. Um, I kind of struggle with, you know, when do I have that conversation with my eight-year-old son? 
Uh, we, many of us have uh, friends and family that are police officers. We don't want our children to grow up being antagonistic or afraid of police or defensive. We want them to understand that we're all human. We all have to be respectful, but I struggle sometimes with how to communicate that narrative. Like, what would you tell well, parents now? How do you communicate how to respond to the police if you're stopped? Well, I was, I was always taught like the way I deal with white supremacists. Mm -hmm. uh, I was taught to speak to everybody. Mm -hmm. See, and in the case of police officers, uh, anybody that had a name tag on with their name on it, mm -hmm. refer to them by name. Sure. See, and um, don't be afraid and don't uh, get angry. Uh, my daddy's mantra was don't get smart. I mean, don't don't get mad and smart. Right. Your dad was yeah. a smart man. Yeah. Yeah. But and he'd say that you're. He was just five feet four. Really. Yeah, and he said wow. you're not going to be more than five, six, or eight at most. So you're <laughs> never going to be able to beat up anybody. So <laughs> you have to use your head. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can think and I'll think somebody that's bigger than you, but you probably won't be able to beat them and you won't feel good if you run from them. All right, that's so, so, yeah. Yeah, well, we'll definitely have to try to integrate that. I'm glad you shared that. Um, I was so troubled. What did you think of the Jacob Blake video? Like what could have been done differently there? Well, let's I know see, uh, no, as, as mayor, the first thing I did, well, Maynard had started it, but we tried to make sure that our police force was half and half black and white. In the city of Atlanta. Oh, in the city of Atlanta, but we also made sure that it was at least a third female. Because okay. women tend to use their brains. For sure we do. Men tend to use, rely on their brawn. For sure, yeah. And so, to have, uh, that was why I thought it was a mistake um, for people to demand that the uh, white woman police chief resign, oh. you know, the complaints in the street. Yeah. Uh, Cause she was the one who probably could deal with the problem better. <clears throat> uh, the problem frankly is that, well, let me go back to um, the fact that almost, I would be willing to bet that over half of our police force has served in the military. And I think 22 veterans a day, that, that's the average number of veterans that commit suicide. That's an accurate number. So the police officers who have been in the military mm -hmm. are, have found a way to cope. But when you put that under the stress of an arrest or any kind of conflict, sure. they also lose their tempers with their wives more easily and they're more insecure in a lot of ways sure. uh, because this war war is not meant for humanity and when you learn to kill or be killed in the military it, it's a burden for you for life i'm afraid and I um, if, um, if our former police chief, Erica Shields, if she had any military background, but I was very disappointed when she resigned and I knew she had resigned under pressure. And sometimes we rush um, well, I, in those situations. I don't think the pressure was from the mayor. I think the pressure was from, well, it was from the NAACP. To have Erica Shields resign, I think, yeah. They, they, they were saying that in the street, that she ought to resign. Yeah. It should. They ought to get rid of her. Mm -hmm. 
uh, and she resigned rather than it become an issue. Uh, I think she thought she was being helpful um, to the mayor okay. by stepping out. Mm -hmm. But um, I did exactly the opposite. We had two black police officers heading our police when I became mayor. Mm -hmm. One was a public safety commissioner, okay. E. Brown, and then George Napa was the chief of police. Okay. When Lee Brown went to New York, mm -hmm. I made George Napa the public safety commissioner, and I brought in a white police chief who had grown up in Atlanta mm -hmm. and who had worked down on Auburn Avenue. Oh, wow. Uh, and uh, during the Civil Rights Movement, he knew he knew more about Atlanta's black community to see the two black the two black PhDs wow. came from California. Wow. And he had grown up in Atlanta. Hmm. Now nobody ever asked did he have a PhD. So he 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 had kind of street smarts. Sure. And that's in being But he 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 had been very instrumental in putting an end to the missing and murdered children mm -hmm. uh, because those bodies were being found out around the suburbs yeah. and uh, in the rural areas and the like. Yeah, that and, is uh, and so to, to break that case, we had to work with other districts beyond the city of Atlanta. Yeah. Well, most of them had white police chiefs okay. who, who were friends of his. And the same thing was true when we got the Olympics. Uh, he was much better at coordinating with the surrounding areas uh, than somebody who had come from out of the region, mm -hmm. whatever their color would be. Yeah. And I'm, so, I, I, I said, I love the way you um, talk about strategy and how you have to be very deliberate in putting the right people in place at the right time. And even though you say you made decisions a lot of times in the moment, but you it seems like you really listen to your gut. Well, no, I make decisions for myself and my life in the moment and one day at a time. Okay. But as mayor, I was always plotting and planning and dreaming about alternatives to, you know, trial and error. Yeah. And, um, but we, we, we need a lot of work. Well, the other thing is, see, I, I went to the policeman um, and realized that their salaries were down below the poverty line. Really? And this was in 1970? No, it was 1981. 1981? Okay. And, um, well, they were right at the poverty line. But that's unacceptable. No, but I, I decided that I was gonna make sure that all of our city workers were above the poverty line. Absolutely. And I did it not only for the water department mm -hmm. and the sanitation workers, but I made sure, I think during the eight years I was mayor, Police officers have got a 75% increase in, 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 in salaries. Wow. But for that, we required them to work a little smarter. Sure. And we had a black and white, you know, command in each zone. Okay. Uh, and uh, we tried not to let um, say two or three white officers go on a case in the black community mm -hmm. without some women or some black police officers being with them. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it sounds like we definitely need to maybe rethink, rethink our present strategy and try to have like an environment inclusivity so that it doesn't seem as threatening and you have everyone kind of coming together 
to solve the problem so police officers can serve and protect, but also have some, um, you know, I think the morale is down among the police officers because they're having to practice defensive policing. I know what that feels like having to practice defensive medicine. You're not yeah. yourself when you feel like you're being attacked or could potentially be attacked, but along those same grains, we also have to emphasize, you know, respect and patience and de-escalation and humanity. All those things are still... Well, one of the reasons why you have to be a good doctor is that if you make a mistake, somebody's going to sue you. Yeah, absolutely. And a big chunk of your profits go into medical insurance just in case something happens. Yeah, a huge chunk. Well, <laughs> I know. Yeah. But that's what we don't have for police officers. Right. And so the unions, now I helped to organize the unions. I thought a unionized police force could de I could deal with, because there were three different groups. Okay, what were the and, three? Well, there was an African-American patrolman. Okay. There was uh, the Brotherhood of Police Officers that was mostly white, mm -hmm. all white. Okay. And then there was a, a AFL-CIO union that had a small group. Okay. And um, I said I would recognize one group. And so they got together and the group that they recognized, that, that they elected, mm -hmm. we recognized as the union with which we negotiated. Okay, but it seems like you brought everyone to the table. But yeah. you know, I don't necessarily know that that's happening. Um, what I am aware of from having family and friends that are officers is that they do have like a psychological assessment in the beginning, which is important because a lot of those officers have served in the military. There's a lot of post-traumatic stress disorder, either undiagnosed or underdiagnosed or undertreated. And then they're, they're set out to serve and to, and to protect. Now, what are your thoughts on maybe having the officers do um, periodic psychological assessments so they can see where their stress level lies. Are there some opportunities to um, help assist with any mental um, disorders and also increase sensitivity, cultural sensitivity training and de-escalation training? Well, all, all of that was a part of the police training when I was mayor. Now, I don't know whether we've let it slack or not. Well, they're well, not we doing psychological testing on a on a um, not on a regular basis. No, and I think that's important because, like with any job, Andy, any job over time, you become affected by what you see. Yeah. You know, talk about when I was doing trauma at Grady, there are things that I saw in the surgeries that I was a part of, um, whether chief resident or as an intern, that I can't even speak about. Like, it, and, and, but I moved on so I can help the next patient, but. Those types of things I've had to get counseling for. And I think it's important that when you're on the front line, whether you're in medicine, whether you're in the police force, that it's important when you're interfacing with the public that you got to have some sort of psychosocial support. Yeah. But for instance, the, um, the problem is, well, Bishop Desmond Tutu in South Africa, mm -hmm. in dealing with South African apartheid. Uh, but when he wrote a book about it, the title of it is No Future Without Forgiveness. Oh, wow. See? I have read that one. And, uh, and in a racial conflict, one of the first things you have to do is not only forgive your adversary, but you have to forgive yourself. Yeah. And, um, and and you also have to take responsibility for some of your shortcomings. Yeah. And that's that's just being a good citizen. Now, black people complain about having to give their children what they could now call the conversation, mm -hmm. see? But that's what you're supposed to do. 
regardless. White children need a conversation with their parents. Their fathers need to tell them, um, well, um, they probably don't listen, but you, you need to tell them about their, well, that, that was one of the things I was proud of with my son, mm -hmm. that uh, when uh, he hit his sister, mm -hmm. and they were both, what, four and six, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, he spanked Jack and whopped him on his butt and said, you cannot hit your sister. And uh, she, his mother said, she hit him. Said, yeah, she can hit him. See, a woman can hit you, but you don't ever hit a woman. See, I don't care what she does or what you've done. See, men do not hit women. Right. See, period, mm -hmm. full stop. See, and um, those are conversations you have to have with your children. Because yeah. hate is taught. I don't necessarily feel that children are born hating. No. Yeah. Children are born insecure. Hmm. See, and you have to help them to be secure and confident. Yeah. So that means an ongoing conversation, which I had with my father. Yeah. And I mean, he, uh, one day we he was, getting ready to wash his face or shave or something and he unwrapped a bar of ivory soap okay. he said see this soap mm -hmm. this soap is 99 and 44 100 percent pure i said yeah i saw that in the advertisement he said that's not good enough for you i said what do you mean he said you can't be 99 percent right wow you have to be 100 percent i said why he said ivory soap is white you're black <laughs> and and if you're white you can cut corners yeah. if you're black you can't yeah. see so it was like you was very clear on that very early on very, very early yeah and you know before we move on from like the subject of the protest i i remember this story you told me a long time ago i asked you what was that last day like with um Martin Luther King, and I was so shocked at what you told me, and um, it was like it was yesterday, and again, it was years back, but do you mind just sharing with, with our listeners or walk me through what that last day was like with him? Because we see in our history books and in video the whole journey, the civil rights movement, but just that last moment, uh, for a lot of us, all we remember is that moment on the balcony. But what was it like before that, leading up to that? Well, just before that, I had been in the federal courtroom all day. And when I came back to Lorraine Motel, mm -hmm. uh, I thought we had won the case and I'd been on the witness stand all day long. Wow. And he said, where have you been? Mm -hmm. And he was, you know, um, Well, I, he was talking loud and jumping on me like, you know, um, and he, he was playing, but he didn't usually act that crazy. And I said, I've been in the courtroom. He said, why didn't you call me? I said, they didn't have a phone in the courtroom. I don't even think they had a phone in the hall. You have to find some way to keep in touch with me. I was worried. I didn't know what was going on in the court. I said, well, you can't know what's going on until it goes on. <laughs> he said, I'm coming to tell you now what went on the court. And he said, you being smart with me. <laughs> and I said, no, I'm not being smart with you. And he picked up a pillow off the bed and he walked beside the head with it. <laughs> you guys had and, a pillow fight uh, right before. Yeah. And, and so I picked up the pillow off the other bed and I swung through it back at him. And I wasn't trying to hit him, but, I, but he was just being so crazy and playful. And next thing you know, his brother and Ralph Abernathy and all of them jumped on me with the pillars on the beds and 
and started beating me in to the ground with the pillows. <laughs> and um, and then uh, somebody knocked on the door and said, you all are due to come to my house for dinner. And it's six o'clock, it's almost six o'clock and you're supposed to be at my house for six for dinner. Uh, and, uh, and that brought a, a little sanity to it. They put it down and then put the pillows down. But I had never seen him in all of his 39 years be that playful. Wow. It was like kids your age and Jack's, you know, <laughs> uh, playing. And, uh, and the next thing I know, a shot rang out and he was gone. Wow. But again, he talked about death all the time mm -hmm. and he was not afraid of death. In fact, I, I look now and say that he went to Memphis deliberately. And I want to ask you, like he had a sense that his life was coming to an end shortly, traveling to Memphis? I think he did. And how so? And I think, and I think he didn't want to die in New York or Washington. He wanted to be with the little people, the least of these God's children. And he was drawn to, I mean, the, the Memphis sanitation workers were off. They were not part of our schedule. That strike was not something that we were working with. But once they went on strike, he kept going. He went back three times to Memphis when we were trying, supposedly trying to get to Washington. And so he kept being drawn to Memphis. And so I guess I, uh, well, I, I decided that he, he used to say, you're gonna die. <laughs> he said, death is the ultimate democracy. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody's got to die. I don't care how rich you are. I don't care what color you are. You're going to die. Wow. And you don't have anything to say about when you die or how you die or even where you die. Your only choice is what is it you give your life for? Sure. Do you have and I think he decided to give his life uh -huh. for these workers who were really almost the poorest of the poor. Yeah, the least of these. Yeah. Have you ever thought back and said you wish you had done something differently that day? I didn't have any choices. I was doing what I was told. Sure. And I, I, I didn't ever want us to go there. Really? Because <laughs> I wanted us to be, uh, <clears throat> I mean, the plan was, I, I didn't want to go to Washington either. See. I tried to get him to take a sabbatical for two years. In fact, he had an offer tentatively to be the pastor at Riverside Church, the interim pastor in New York. Hmm. And I said, all your life, you've wanted to pastor a big church like this and teach at Union Theological Seminary. And he had offered to him at 38 years old. And I said, you can take a, you can take a, a two year sabbatical and we can keep going without you. We can't have any big campaigns, but that'll give you a chance uh, to have a good pulpit, uh, to be around a lot of wise people and in the middle of New York and take two years to plan what we do with the next 10 years. And, and he, that was what he really wanted to do. Mm -hmm. If you had asked him when he was 30, what would you like to do when the movement's over? That's what he would have said. Wow. And, and yet, he wouldn't, he wouldn't leave us. 
to take an easier job. Wow. That's so fascinating. But I think what's even more fascinating is that it gives us a little bit of, um, does our heart some good knowing that his last moments up until the end were with people that he loved. It was surrounded by great joy and support and the lightheartedness that he probably needed because he sounds like he was very heavy going in. Well, he was. Yeah. Because that had been a very rough year. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, he was attacked. The worst press attack he ever had was one year to the day before he was killed. Really? When we, and it was April the 4th, uh, 1967. Mm -hmm. And um, we'd been meeting with the ambassador to the United Nations. And when we came out, the press wanted him to talk. Mm -hmm. And he said, I'd rather not talk about this meeting because Ambassador Goldberg invited us to meet and I think it's appropriate that he should talk about it. He said, well, did you talk about China? He said, no, we didn't. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, what do you think about China? Okay. And he, he called himself being very careful. He said, well, 800 million people are not going to disappear simply because we refuse to admit that they exist. Wow. And he was attacked from one end of the, of the world to the other. Wow. That a, a black man is not supposed to have an opinion. If the United States government says they are not in, important, then they're not important. Wow. He didn't say they were important. He just said that they're not going to disappear. And we're going to have to deal with them, which we are doing now. Right, you saying the facts. He was the first one to say that. Wow. And a, a black man was not supposed to lead in foreign policy. Hmm. Wow. And, and that was as late as 1967. Wow, that wasn't very long ago. And here we are, I guess we can move on to our topic of the upcoming presidential election. Um, and um, I guess the main thing is, I want to know what your thoughts are. You don't necessarily have to share where you're politically aligned, but what's important regardless of where you're aligned right now in terms of our presidential well, moving forward? We have a global imperative. None of these problems are just American problems. Everybody has a virus problem. Everybody is affected by climate change. I mean, the fires in California are matched by fires in Australia. Right. See, um, th there's a worldwide climate crisis um, that we see in the number of hurricanes and things. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, but that can't be settled by any one country. Right. No one country can settle the virus problem because the viruses crop up all over the world. Uh, and um, everybody's economy has been hit by this virus. So yeah. we're going to have to reorganize the world economy. Yeah. Uh, and strengthen the World Health Organization and, um, and develop a business plan to get the whole world economy back on its feet. We might not like China, but we and it cannot do without us and we cannot do without China. Europe cannot do without us and we cannot do without Europe. See, Africa, we thought we could get along without, uh, but so much of our raw materials and minerals come from Africa that um, we're not gonna be able to get along without Africa and Latin America. Mm -hmm. <coughs> it sounds like we have to- We are one world under God. That's right. I love that. Um, so in this upcoming- So the question is, yeah. Who who is who is the best president? Best person for to help to, to help reorganize the world. Yeah. And I think the present president, the incumbent, I call him. Sure. Um, 
tried to bully the world into shape. And that has not worked, and it ne will never work. Sure. See, uh, but um, I think we have a smart, wise, uh, and dedicated team to take on the troubles of the world okay. and to resolve them in the interests of all of the people of the United States of America. Mm -hmm. And I've known Joe Biden since he was, he went to Cong he went to the Senate in 1972 and I went to Congress in 1972. And even back then, we knew who he was because not long after he was elected, his wife and daughter got killed. Mm. And it was very tragic. Yeah. And he used to, but he went home on a train every day, mm -hmm. uh, commuting back and forth uh, to keep on, raise, to help raise his sons. Yeah. And so everybody thought of him as a hero and had a great deal of respect for him back then. Wow. Um, and a lot of people aren't aware of that narrative, you know, that he is just, he is just a man, but a humane one is trying to do the right thing. And, um, I'm, I'm just excited also that he chose a, a woman uh, as his running mate, kept that promise. And uh, quite frankly, a woman that looks- Well, he didn't choose a woman. What did he choose? He chose the smartest person available for the job. I agree. She just happened to be a so woman. She just happened to be a woman. Yes. <laughs> so yes. the other day, what do you call a female surgeon? I said, you call her a surgeon. So I get that. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm so excited, you know, for that and just um, just hoping regardless of what people align that people get out and vote, you know, a big part of protesting is with your vote and uh, just being more politically active. We can't sit this one or any of the upcoming elections out. Um, well, so you know, you do it at your peril. Um, and you can walk out straight in front of a truck if you want to. You have that much freedom. Yeah. Uh, but it, it, it'd be stupid to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I appreciate all your time as always. I know Carolyn probably has dinner waiting for you. Um, so <laughs> we're going to wrap up. But I would love if you could just help end our conversation with the, the, the best P of the pandemic, the protests, the police and our president. And that P is prayer. And just to send out just prayers and support for our country, for our nation, and dealing with the four Ps. But prayer, I think, is the cornerstone of everything. And so if you could just grace us with that before we go, I really appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Father, we're thankful. We're thankful that you have given us an opportunity to communicate over great distance and to be able to reach out and share your blessings, your world, with all so many others, regardless of race, creed, color, gender. We ask that you would take these crises in our lives and put them together in a way that we can understand and that you give us a vision of the kind of world that you would like us to have. The kind of world that completes and continues your loving creation that might make this earth more like the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. We're thankful for all of the blessings you've given us in these United States of America. And we realize that we amongst all nations are the most blessed. And we also know that to them to whom much has been given, of them is much required. And we know you require us to bring a new level of vision and leadership. Right now, we're a little bit confused. And so we ask your blessing. We ask that you share with those who are running for public office, those who are in the private sector leading our businesses, those who are trying to protect us in our law enforcement, and those who are struggling to heal the nation both physically and spiritually 
We ask that you would give each of us a vision that will make this earth more like your kingdom. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen.